Where's my research? What did I What did I look up for this case? Also, are you prepped on the research? Did you research it, or are you blind? When I tell you that I have like not been able to sleep because of this, <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Yes. Oh no. Well, did you know? Okay, so I didn't. I had never heard of the Delphi murders. Like I, I mean, maybe I had heard of that, but I didn't know what the case was. But then I f- remembered once I was reading this, I was like, oh. I've seen this picture, like this still of the guy who was following them off the train track. So I guess I did know it. I just didn't know how horrific it was and how eerie this was. Mm-hmm. I actually feel like I've heard of it before just because the name Delphi is like such a random name of a town. And I think I like yeah, remember Delphi, hearing Indiana. it before. Yeah. Um, like the spelling is odd. And like, I remember that kind of stuck with me, but I don't remember um, back in 2017, being aware of the case. Um, but it has left me shook. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's crazy because it was such a big story at the time. I think because this was a small town where things like this don't happen, but also it's still unsolved. We're like five years later and it's still unsolved. I know. I think we're closer. I mean, I I have some theories and I have a list of suspects and like reasons as to why they would make sense. I don't know if you saw any of the suspects and like recent developments. I did. I did see like the most recent development. Um, okay, cool. But we'll get I, there. I have, I know, I have a few things that might like counter it. So I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, I will just say hello, everybody. Welcome back to Creep Time, the podcast with your hosts, Silasine and Stu. Hello. Hi, creepers. Hi, creepers. We missed you. It's been 24 seconds yeah. since we last <laughs> recorded. <laughs> My favorite thing is when I put out an episode and then immediately get comments and they're like, you don't post enough. And I'm like, I just put out a new episode. <laughs> well, Creepers, it is my fault because we missed last week, but um, we're, we're hitting you with no, this is great. two for one, baby. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we're going to give them like dual action this week. Um, so I'm super excited. Thank you to everybody who's listening. And again, thank you to everybody who is spreading the word about Creep Time, the podcast. I love to hear that you tell your friends, your family, you play it in the car and you get people involved in true crime, I think that is great, and we really appreciate the support. <laughs> stoic. No. I was like, do I? <laughs> I... <laughs> you were like, absolutely. I... Absolutely. Yeah, creepers. I should have I should have said, should have said what my face was showing, uh, which is, we, <laughs> we really, Legal really appreciate it. It was, very... <laughs> it was just, um, it was the most rich, like, prideful moment I think I've seen at you. <laughs> you were like 100%. Of 100%. <sighs> well, I guess with that, we can just dive right in because I actually have, I have so much research on this too. Like I'm going to have to dive in straight away because we have a lot to get through here. So for anybody who doesn't know the story of um, the Delphi case, I'm just going to give you a top line of what we're about to get into. So The story centralizes around Liberty German, uh, Libby for short, and Abigail Williams, Abby for short. And they were two young girls who were best friends and did everything together, these girls, inseparable. And the case, like we said, is pretty recent, as recent as 2017. And when it happens in their lives, they're about halfway through eighth grade. So I think one of them was 13, one is 14, but they're fairly close in age, obviously. And this happened on a day off from school in a small town called Delphi, Indiana. Hmm. I had never heard of Delphi, just for the record. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's only about a half hour, uh, I think, north or northeast of Indianapolis. I think you're right. I'm I'm pretty sure. I I remembered reading that in the research. So what happens is the teens take a walk down some of the historic wooded trails on the eastern side of town, and they ended up stepping onto an old railroad bridge. And this was a very, like, popular spot for, like, local photographers, for nature watchers, people who like to hike. But the girls quickly realized that they were not alone. And we have camera footage of this moment, which is the most sinister part of the story. And obviously, what transpires next is horrific, and we're going to get into every bit of it step by step. But before I do... I just want to hear, like, what was your gut reaction when you first read this? Were you just, like, jaw on the floor? It took me a while to get to the part where they released the camera footage. And that, I immediately was like, oh, like, I had to go find the shot. And 
what I saw was just yeah. so eerie. And we still don't have all of it, which is the craziest part. That's almost one of the more interesting parts about this case, like how secretive and um, protective police have been. Yes, yes. About releasing information. Yes. And I don't know if, if that helps or hurts, to be honest, because obviously if you release more of the video, you can probably identify the person unless they're saving it for court. I think so, because, uh, yeah, I guess you don't want people to come forward that aren't the killer for like fame or whatever, like trying to claim that that's them in that video. So they don't want to, yeah. but at the same time, yeah, I was thinking a lot about this um, while reading about the case that to what degree does it start to help or hurt? And especially with a case like this, where it's been going on and on and on for like five years. Um, half a, a half a decade. Yeah. Like at some point, just put the information out. We don't even know how they died is the craziest part. I know. I know. I know you'll get into that, but um, yeah, I can't wait to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So let's shift back in. So I'll tell you exactly what happened. So a man was walking towards them. Like we said, they were in this sort of wooded trail that was coming off of this old um, bridge and he's walking towards them and he's seen wearing jeans, a hoodie and a coat and he has his hands in his pockets. And for unknown reasons, uh, which, you know, we could have different theories on this. German, uh, Libby German, she takes out her phone and she starts recording a brief video of the man. But that decision proved to be really, you know, critical to this case in trying to figure out what happened to them, who did this, and what their final moments looked like. So this was the last time that this video was taken that the girls were actually seen alive or, I guess, recorded alive. So... This video is recovered once the phone is eventually recovered and they go through and they see that it also includes audio snippets that include this man's voice and what they, what entailed with the interaction. So this is a chilling video. However, I will preface that not all of it is available because as we said, police have been very secretive and very selective about which pieces of evidence they're releasing. And a lot of this evidence that we have now today has taken years before it's either been leaked or it's been selectively um, served to the public. So what we know is that the day started, like I said, this is February 13th, um, so the day before Valentine's Day, and they are off from school, so it's around 1.35 p.m. That 13-year-old Abigail um, Williams and 14-year-old Libby German are dropped off by German's older sister, Kelsey German. And this is on County Road 300 North, which is east of the Hoosier Heartland Highway, I think is how it's said. And the girls were hiking to the bridge, which is right near Deer Creek. And they're kind of in this, you know, wooded remote area, which is um, at the border of the Deer Creek Township. So then what we know is that shortly after they started on the hike, this is around 2.07 p.m., Libby posted a photo of Abby walking on the bridge. So we, we understand that they're walking, they're kind of just Snapchatting, and they're, you know, they're, they're just doing what you do like when you're in middle school, you just go on walks around your town. Um, but after this, they were not heard from again until we eventually find out what, what the timestamp was of when that second video was recorded after the po picture was posted at 2.07. So by 5.30 p.m., after they failed to meet Libby's father at 3.15 p.m., that is when panic starts to ensue. So the families actually initially searched for the girls because they hadn't suspected anything sinister had really happened quite yet, that maybe they had were just being irresponsible, they lost track of time, you know, they're 13, 14. So the family is searching for the girls well before they even call the police. But then eventually, when they do call police that night and police get involved, not even they are suspecting anything sinister has happened. They don't suspect foul play in the disappearance just right off the bat. However, all of this would change within 24 hours when we reach noon of the following day. And this is about a half a mile east um, of the abandoned bridge that they were last seen posting a picture from and walking near. The bodies of the two girls were found in the north bank of Deer Creek. Now... This was shocking for this community. I've watched so much news coverage interviewing people from the town and like the fear that and how this this rattled the people of this community to know that two young girls were uh, kind of brutally found like this. But what we initially get from police is that, like I said, they hadn't released a lot of details from the get-go and they still haven't. 
But the only detail that I could ever really find talking about what exactly happened to their bodies, because we don't know 100% how they died, it mentioned later in a warrant, which I'll get into, which was obtained, I think, by like Fox 59 News, like a local Fox News station or something, that mentioned a significant amount of blood at the time and a search for some kind of a cutting tool or a cutting weapon, which would indicate this most likely happened as the result of stab wounds or like slit wounds along the neck is what a lot of people have said. And what was really interesting about the crime scene, and I don't know if you read this, Sue, Mm. it was described in the warrant that their bodies were positioned and staged in odd ways. Do you remember? Did you read this? Yeah. Freaky. Because there's a few different reasons why somebody would do that, but I, I find that to be very, very odd in the context of everything that goes down. Yeah. Um, Are we going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say it suggests that this person wasn't worried about, like, the time it was going to take them to get the crime scene staged and that they're sinister, like, to a level that they're... Totally. They're so conscious of, like, what they're doing. Like, this doesn't seem like a freak thing. Like, they... Like, you know, in some of these other cases, it's like the mind takes over and something like this was very, um, like Like premeditated. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally agree. Well, it's, I'm curious because there are, that can mean a few different things. When we talk about bodies being staged, it can be like, I'm staging it to make it look like not a murder at first. Although I don't really know how one could do that or making it look like there was a fight between them. But I think it was the other version of that where the bodies are staged in an unusual or degrading position. Mm-hmm. Very like, very Jeffrey Dahmer um, as, as sort of like, I, I don't know, like an aftermath doing to, yes. to like further humiliate the people you just killed. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was more so that. So where does that leave us? So we talked about the significant amount of blood. We talked about the bodies being staged in unusual positions, which we don't have full clarity on. And as early as February 15th, 2017, this is when the Indiana State Police begins circulating an image of a composite, basically an individual who was reported to be seen near that bridge on the day where the two girls, or relatively close to where the two girls were found slain. So... The composite image is based off of a grainy photograph that also appears at the time, and this is the only, like, sliver that they initially released from that video that's recovered from her phone. So what it shows is Caucasian male. Like I said, he's got the hands in the pockets. He's walking on the rail bridge, um, and he's headed down towards the girls. Like, he's moving pretty quick towards them. So then a few days later... Uh, The person in that photograph was named as the prime suspect in the double homicide because at first nobody really knew what happened in the press. They were like, they just knew that two girls were found killed. It could have been that they fought each other. It could have been murder-suicide between one of them. It could have like very like slender man killings. You ever seen that? Yeah. Um, I, I haven't, but I should know what that is. That was, I think that was one, this is like back on like the original creepypasta days when Slender Man, like the folklore of Slender Man was kind of brewing up on the internet. And there was an adult, like an online man who was posing as Slender Man and basically convinced a young girl who was like 13 that to join him, she would have to like do like an honor killing or not an honor killing, it's not the initiation killing. That's what I meant. Uh. And she like lured her two friends into the woods and attempted to stab them to death. Like, oh my God, like 10, 15 times. And they miraculously lived somehow. (sighs) Um, It's, it's such a psychotic story, but I think like that had Mm. happened that had definitely happened prior to 2017. So maybe that was the first thing that came to their Mm -hmm. minds. Um, Just some sort of horrific, I don't know, exchange like that fight. But as I said, we cl- we quickly have that video that releases, and we have a prime suspect who is seen in that camera footage. Um, but it's shockingly difficult to identify um, because he does he have a cap in the the video? I'm pretty sure he has a cap on his head, right? He does. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He's got a cap. He's kind of bundled up. It looks it looks cold. Um, and then we shift over to let's see, February 22nd. So this is when law enforcement ends up going a step further, and they released the audio recording where we can hear the voice of the suspect for the first time. And it's greatly muffled, but you can clearly hear him say, guys, down the hill. 
people have debated that too, whether whether or not that's actually what he says. It seems pretty clear to me that's most definitely he's saying down the hill. What I read that was um I don't know if you read this, but that they released down the hill first. Mm-hmm. And then later they released guys. It's like guys, pause, pause, pause down the hill, which which is interesting. Why? Why would I like all of this is very strange to me? Like the the selectivity around why they release certain things at certain times. I can't imagine that like that would, I, I don't know, throw things off or like misinform like the the lead. The whole thing is so confusing to me. It really is. But you're right, though. I think they did release just down the hill, just that audio snippet, which has since been re-released. I think in previous years, where they've they've actually had um, like audio engineers work on it to try to get like even clearer sound quality to really mm-hmm. hear his voice. So it was at this exact news conference um, where the officials released this, where they also credited the source uh, of the audio and the imagery coming from Libby's phone, which I, I think we had assumed because who else would have been there to record that or share any of those pictures. But she's kind of, you know, praised as the hero of this for being of sound mind and, you know, the fort- having the mental fortitude to secretly record her exchange as evidence. And police indicated that there was additional evidence from the phone that had been secured and will continue to be secured. So we still don't have anything on this case, like have everything. Um, mm-hmm. And when they choose to, you know, release that, it sounds like, it, it will have more to do with the actual trial. So it's around this time that a reward is finally put up uh, for $41,000 for anybody who has additional footage, information, witness accounts, anything that can help the case go further. So then we fast forward to July 17th, and this is when officers distributed the official composite sketch um, of someone who at the time of the investigation, they believed was the prime person of interest um, And I think this corresponded, it was drawn off of an eyewitness of another hiker who happened to be in the area around that day and saw somebody who they said would fit this description, although it would later come to light that this was not the person. So they're already starting off on a bad foot, like six months into this investigation where they're putting out a composite sketch that's kind of drastically different from the man who's seen in the video, which made no sense to me. I don't know why they wouldn't go off of actual camera footage versus an eyewitness account. Maybe it's a a mix between the two. So we shift over to April 19th, 2019, and this is when the Indiana State Police announced a new direction in the case. On behalf of the State Police and a multi-agency task force, Superintendent Doug Carter released more materials uh, just a few days later during a press conference that was held on April 22nd. Now, about two years into the case, and we're still no closer to any solve here, like I said. So we, we really have no idea what exactly happened to the Delphi girls, because even up until this point, up until 2019, we still don't have confirmation as to how they died or if they're even remotely close to a lead. But the new materials that they do release, this is when we get the shorter version of the actual video over just a still and that's where we see the, you know, the sort of blue jeaned, um, jacketed suspect uh, who's walking along the rail bridge with, for just like little over a second. They release like literally like two to three seconds of this video. They don't want to release any more, and I don't know, I don't know why. So superintendent, uh, superintendent Carter states that because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect was walking unnaturally as a way to kind of like move between the spacing of the planks along the bridge. So right. we we now have a compromised view of the suspect's walk. So it's it's just getting it's so uh, it's so difficult to identify them. Like it's between like the graininess of the footage, but also like the way he has his face positioned and the way she filmed it, but also he's walking in a strange way. It's like I think all of these things played into how challenging it's been for them to nail somebody for this. I also didn't quite understand, maybe you can help me with this, like mm-hmm. why, so my my feeling was that it's incredible that she was filming, that she got her phone out to film this guy. Yeah. The, the video of him coming, walking towards them, it almost feels like she could sense something strange from very far away, like mm-hmm. either that or that she like wanted to film this person because like they were 
meeting him or like knew him or something. I don't know. I just don't understand why you start filming point. someone that's coming from, a, like they're coming from the other direction towards you. Mm-hmm. Um, I read about this so exact I, thing actually when I was looking at yeah. theories, and I think you you touched on something I hadn't thought about, which was the idea of them potentially going in there to plan to meet somebody, and then they see this guy yeah. walking up, and they're making a joke out of it, and they're like, "Oh my god, we just got catfished," kind of thing, or yeah, yeah. or because it didn't seem very funny at the time, like when they were filming the video, it could have been, and th- I've read this in a lot of the theories that they had had a run in with this guy somewhere else in the woods prior. So maybe they bumped into him just so he could get close and kind of like assess, you know, like maybe not go full throttle with what he was planning to do, but he could assess the situation and then sort of stalk them for a while from afar. And then at the very end, he goes in for the kill. And that's when they're like, that guy is back. Film, you should film him. And I think part yeah. of the reason why there's no concrete um, identification of his face is because as he approaches them, I think they got scared and they like maybe tilted the phone down because we, we have 43 yeah. seconds of video that hasn't been released, but there's audio there. We just don't have, obviously, if we had identification or video of his face, he would have been caught by now. Like, they, they would have released that. So it's just audio. I think that's why they haven't released it. It's like, we can't really do much with audio unless, I don't know, we have like a clear sample to compare it to. It's much harder to do as opposed to someone's face. Right. But wouldn't you think, even if it was just audio, the or well, it is just the audio that they haven't released. I guess if we're mm-hmm. determining that they put the phone down, I would imagine they're freaking screaming, like saying "Get off of us" or something. Which I feel like I've thought about that too. He, yeah, I feel like he would have had to have said, you know, sh- "Shut up" or something. Mm-hmm. But yes, the, it just irks me that we don't get the public didn't get more to go off of. Right. Well, people have gleaned a lot from just that single snippet that we have where he goes down the hill. And a lot of people have said that's actually yeah. a drill command. Um, and that would come from something like law enforcement or like military background. Because he says, guys, down the hill, like ushers them down the hill. And a lot of people, although this has never been confirmed, have said that he flashes a fake police badge. So this is like the exact thing that we were talking about with Missy Beavers. where like, huh. you're immediately disarmed and like moving along with what anybody tells you if they present the image of authority or police, especially if you're a middle school girl, like if you're out there, wow, I just got chills. Yeah. Yeah. You're out there like you're smoking weed or like you're doing something like in the woods, like something that could get you in trouble, I guess with like an adult or law enforcement and some, maybe they're like, Oh my God, undercover cop comes out and he goes down the hill kind of thing. Like I'm going to call your parents. And before they know it, something goes really wrong. Yeah. That's, because I thought the same exact thing. I'm like, unless they're, they're frozen, unless they're petrified. Because like, sometimes I think it's, if you're really scared and you feel really cornered, you almost don't scream if you know in your mind that you're in a remote place. Because that's even scarier to scream and just know in the back of your head, no one's going to hear me. No one's going to hear me. Right. And like, it could also guess, aggravate the yeah. perpetrator. There's a lot. I, I I just think that Libby being that intelligent to take her phone out and start to film that she, I, could chill a, I, that. I have a, I have a gut feeling that she would have tried to like push back or run away or do something like, I don't know why I can't imagine a girl that has the fortitude to pull out her phone, mm-hmm. just like being silent and being commanded to, I mean, unless she really thought like, okay, I'm just going to play this safe and be quiet. So there is evidence, although again, it's tough because like a lot of this is like, we, we can kind of assume this from like something we've seen in a warrant and like a piece of like information that came from the family here. But there is some evidence that she fought back at one point. And I'll get into Mm -hmm. that with like some of what we find from the warrant. Um, it was, it wasn't that, I don't think it was a full on, like I'm trying to defend myself. I think it was a little bit of a fight and she was very quickly overtaken by whoever this guy was. But it is around this time, I think, now that they're releasing additional footage that an updated sketch of the suspect is then unveiled. And like I said, we get the extended version of the audio, and it's been enhanced by audio engineers. So we get that slight raise to the suspect's voice, where this is where the first time we hear the word guys before the phrase down the hill. And 
it was further explained that, you know, that previous sketch, that, you know, kind of showing, there was another sketch that came out showing like an older man with a goatee. Um, that was now considered secondary. So they haven't even ruled that out. They're like, this person could still be a suspect, which tells me that they really don't have visual confirmation on that footage at all of what this guy looked like, except for that three second period from a distance. Police just give like the widest range for the suspect with this. They're like, could be 18 to 40, but also he could be much older and just gives like a youthful appearance or might have like a clean shave. And I immediately mm-hmm. thought when I heard 18 to 40, I was like Lady of the Dunes. I, I thought I the like, same thing. <laughs> I was like 18, to, or what is it, 25 to 49. I was like, yeah, selective. That range. <laughs> I know. And you know what else struck me was uh, that police said the suspect is likely a mix of the two composites. It's just kind of, what, I was like, what are what these guys mean? doing? Yeah. I don't yeah. Know what I'm like, means. what are these guys doing? Like, I, the, I don't, the strategy that they took at the beginning, once it started to kind of fall apart and mm-hmm. they released different and more stuff, I was just kind of like, oh, like the credibility here is starting to like wean. And, and I don't really know I how agree. much of it is their fault, but if I were the killer, I would be like rubbing my hands together like, oh, these guys aren't going to get me kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, I mean, well, every year that this goes on without a solve, statistically, it is less likely to be solved, especially something that happened in 2017 where like we have sophisticated forensics, we have DNA evidence. We should, in theory, if we've got camera footage and audio recording and DNA evidence, we should, in theory, be able to nail whoever this is. But I'm, I'm... honest to God, shocked that they haven't. It, it floors me because like they're released, they're not releasing something that I think is really pivotal to this story that would make sense as to like why it wouldn't be any of the suspects that they've looked at because they've looked at a lot of people. Yeah. I don't get I it. I know. I was amazed to, to read about how many people they interviewed and they've still never, and, and oh, and that they said eventually that, we believe we may have interviewed you before and you're still like walking amongst us sort of thing. But, Oh, I didn't read that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Really? So they've called in a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of their key suspects have since died too, which in my mind, I'm like, if that's the case, then I, I feel like that rules them out because if they had, if they had died, if it had gotten to that point and there's no chance of a trial, I suppose, post-mortem, yeah. then you might as well just come out and say, most of our evidence points to person A, right? But they haven't done so. It's weird. Mm -hmm. So let's see. The investigators revealed they had reason to believe, pretty much like what you just said, that the suspect might be hiding in plain sight, which I'm assuming means that this is a a local person who is just going about their life after this. And the person is is most certainly familiar with the Delphi area and probably this trail. They're either living there They work in the area. They grew up in the area. They're familiar or had plotted this out to a T. An additional plea was made to help identify the driver of a vehicle. Did you hear about this? A vehicle that was left abandoned. And this was on the Heartland Highway, like I mentioned, that's in Delphi. Uh, And it was right outside of a former child services office. So I think the road is kind of like a, it's a fully abandoned road. Like nobody really goes there, but a car was parked there. Sometime we know between noon to 5 p.m. on the day of the murders, so we believe it's connected. And this person most likely drove on the highway in a stolen or unregistered vehicle, left it there on this this off-road from the highway, and then just made their way into the woods, which does lead to this old rail bridge, which to me feels extremely deliberate and premeditated. I mean, that is a full that is a fully thought out plan. Right. I did not read that. Wow. Really? Really? No. Well, there, it, it bleeds into like more of the theory too about like, was the car used at all? Like after um, the actual murders took place, like did this person, because if they had a trail, you have to think about like where they actually went after this happened. And I have mm-hmm. some really good timestamps of, I've, I've literally created like a timeline here based on like the warrants, the timestamps, phone pings, final pictures that were taken and what the family has said they know, because the family definitely knows more than we ever will. Um, Mm -hmm. But I've created a little timeline here of like how this probably went in sequence. But before I get into that, 
I have a few I have a few other things to like tee or finish off on for like this part of this and then we're gonna get into some of the suspects. Yeah. So like I said, this suggests to me that they are eyeing somebody who knows the trails very well. So most likely either a person who had planned this many, many weeks to months beforehand, or somebody who knows the area naturally because they grew up there. So in my mind, I'm imagining that there is also a scenario here where, like we said, they had posted a picture on social media, like on the story, like either Snap or Insta, of where they were, the girls. This is 207. That could have been used, especially for somebody who knows the area very well and is in that area and maybe like five minutes down the road to seize the opportunity if they're following them and following their story. And this gets uncovered with one of the suspects that there is a man, an, an adult man who was in connection with these girls with a catfish profile. And he says, they're right by the bridge. They're walking on the train tracks in the, like um, near Deer Creek in the Delphi um, wooded area. I'm going to go there right now in this junk car that I've got and I'm going to corner them. Mm-hmm. I, in my mind, I was thinking, I was like, that's how this played out for sure. But sadly, Mm -hmm. the case, even though it happened in 2017, it may still never see justice because we are this far along and we still don't have a solid culprit as to who did this to these girls. It's so, it's so sad, but, and I know you're going to launch into all the different suspects, but each one, I didn't feel confident enough to, to feel like I knew who it was sort of that like gut feeling of like that that's tracking for me or whatever, except mm-hmm. for one, which, yeah. Well, I think it's probably, we probably have the same one. Cause I'll go into some, I'll yeah. go into the theories behind some of the suspects as well. And like why they make sense, why they don't, but also the number one person. And I, I didn't buy it at first because I, I didn't have that gut reaction either where I was like, I don't know. I'm like parts of this add up, but parts of it don't based on timing and like it would, I don't know, it would take a certain type of person to pull this off. But I since changed that, but then came across the warrant, which completely shifted my thought on this person. So now I don't really know what to think, but I will run you through some of the initial suspects. So the first person we're going to look at is Daniel J. Nations. Did you hear about this guy? Mm -hmm. He was a registered sex offender from Indiana who was arrested in Woodland Park, Colorado in September of 2017 and charged with threatening strangers on a monument trail with a hatchet, which, you know, for one, kind of tracks with, like, stalking somebody through the woods, Um, especially since we don't know the actual murder weapon, and it's just described as a blade-type weapon. Could be an axe, a knife, a hatchet, could be an actual razor blade. But... The expired Indiana plates on his car um, that he was driving, this got noticed by police who subsequently pull him over, and it's discovered he has all these outstanding warrants under his name. So fanning public speculation still further, uh, it was reported that a bicyclist had been fatally shot on the same trail at around the same time that this guy was in that that monument trail, Um, but that wasn't the same state or place. But it was all just, like, kind of the parallel here is that, like, it was just this is somebody who's kind of from this area. He was from Indiana who has had a history of doing something like this. So it could have been him. But Mm -hmm. that's not enough to plant any kind of legitimate evidence around, like, he was he knew these girls and who they were, where they would be, and he plotted to do so. He also doesn't seem like a, a killer who plans very well i don't know i imagine somebody who's waiting out in the woods with a hatchet isn't really looking for like a specific kill they're just looking to harm somebody right yeah it didn't really it wasn't really landing yeah and to like shoot a bicyclist that's just like so random it's just like yeah this this didn't feel random no not at all not at all but eventually i think he's sentenced by 2018 i think january 5th um but I don't know if the bicycle shooting was actually ever tied to him. It just happened to happen on the same day, (laughs) which seems pretty, I mean, (laughs) we can deduce, but he's Mm -hmm. sentenced on probation um, for threatening other members in Colorado and for doing that with the hatchet. Uh, However, he gets released. Okay. So he was not released on the probation because of the active warrant that dated back to when he was in Indiana. So then On January 24th, he gets transferred, you know, to Indiana officials. Um, He's in custody with them for another unrelated charge. He failed to register as a sex offender, I think. 
And then by February 2018, authorities said that Nations was no longer considered an active person of interest. So they just drew this conclusion where they were like, we're looking for anybody who has a history of hiding out in the woods and, you know, going after innocent people. And the Delphi murders just could not be connected to this man, even though there's that odd parallel. But then they shift their interest and they look to Thomas Bruce, um, who was a pastor. Did you read this one? Yes, yes. Oh my God. We really we really have to do an episode one time. I, I remember hearing this on another podcast about um, a nun, an 80-something-year-old nun who was brutally killed in a church, and it was by the priest. <laughs> But it, it wasn't even like a like a spur of the moment killing. It was like with a vengeance. Like he carved symbols into her. I wait. Are these <laughs> the nineteen sixty nine murders? It was a woman that like oh it was, could be. It might be. I watched a documentary about this. She was a nun, a teacher, mm-hmm. and he, she was trying to kind of protect some of the other young women that were attending the school from this. Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's the, the, yeah. She, I think she had like, she was the only one, maybe like the matriarch, I, I guess of like yes. the community and she stood up to him and that defiance alone was enough yes. for him to yes. be like, I am going to brutally kill you in a church. Yep. Yep. Sinister. <laughs> Sinister. Disgusting. So to get into something even more disgusting, let's shift back into Thomas Bruce, this pastor who was yeah. charged with fatally shooting one woman and then sexually assaulting two others after having ordered them at gunpoint to a back room at a, okay, it's a suburban St. Louis uh, shop for religious supplies. What are included with religious supplies? Just curious. Maybe I'm out of the loop. I think like Bibles and devotional books and like rosaries and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like a Bible. I mean, a Christian bookstore, I would think they can't order on Amazon. I (laughs) right. Can you order Bibles on Amazon? I'm sure you can order everything on Amazon. Oh, I'm sure you can. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe like custom, a custom crucifix or like a very large one, like a decorative one. I could see that. Yeah. So, this crime, though, was committed in broad daylight, and this was on November 19th, 2018, um, when these crimes put Bruce in the spotlight with the press. And I'm trying to remember what the connection was as to why they were like, oh, he was definitely involved in the Delphi case. So I think someone had called out in like a tip to the police or something, and they said he was really close in terms of stature and, and physicality and like facial um, similarities to the man and the composite sketch that was put out in the Delphi slangs. And he also was wearing that same, like a similar cap, like flat cap and a blue Navy blue jacket during his attack, which was not unlike the video footage that came out of the Delphi case. So everybody was like, this is the dude, this is the Mm -hmm. guy. Um, And they did look into a possible connection, I think by November of that year. But on December 4th, Bruce was charged (laughs) with no fewer than 17 felonies that were related to the case that happened in uh, St. Louis. And he's sentenced with, you know, to life without parole, but would later fall under suspicion, like I said, for being connected to the Delphi murders. But after they looked into it, they just realized that he was not the assailant. There There was no evidence outside of that similarity in terms of physicality and him also being a murderer um, or an attempted murderer. Uh, to do this. So he falls out of suspicion as well. So they're just going through a lot of dead ends here. And I think the last person who's kind of maybe a dead end in this that they look at is on July 23rd of 2019. That's Paul Etter, um, who was wanted for the kidnapping and rape of a 26 year old woman that took place on June 22nd in Teepee Canoe County. I think it's called, I think it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. So Etter was one of multiple suspects who was being investigated for the Delphi murders. I think, through the majority of the earlier part of the case. And according to Carroll County Sheriff, uh, Toby Lezenby, I think is how you say his name, five days later, so this is July 28th, 2019, after I think they're um, they're pursuing him for this uh, horrific kidnapping and rape that he did, he's surrounded by police. And after a five-hour standoff, he ends up killing himself. And investigators had received tips on Etter being connected to the Delphi murders up until this point and even after, but it was unclear how the authorities determined that he wasn't the killer, but they did. Um, 
And I feel, like I said, since he's died, I think if there was a connection, they would have been able to determine it by now. We, they just never really closed the loop there. Like I said, almost every tip, every lead, all of these potential suspects, they just fall flat in the investigation and it remains unsolved um, until, until we get a break that gives us a little runway here. But before I get into it, did you encounter this with the research, like the frustration of going through all of the potential suspects in the timeline and you're like, God damn, like, can yes, you guys get yes. anything Yes, I was like, like, I know. I was just like, okay, one of these has to be almost foolproof like I feel that they are the person and for me as I was reading about the case I was hoping that there would be a suspect that had a history of like child um like pedophilia or something because I think to kill children is a really just like I mean I definitely think it yeah it's specific and I think it requires like like the Oklahoma uh, Girl Scout murders. I think it requires like some sexual deviance normally too, and mm-hmm. so agreed. I was like, okay, we have some sex offenders like on, on the suspect line. Like that, that seems like so. So I was feeling positive, and then I was kind of like, okay, but they have offended uh, older women, like, like adult like, women, yeah, adult women, and I was kind of like, and then yeah. You know what was really odd, though, that you're bringing that up? Because I'm thinking now back to the warrant. And one thing that a lot of people have called out is that it is described that they were positioned in unusual positions or staged, or unusual positions and staged. But I'm pretty sure it explicitly says that there was no evidence of sexual assault, which I find really interesting. Because I I would assume that the two sort of go hand in hand. Because I'm trying to, I'm just trying to understand, like you said, like, the intention to go after, pursue, and kill children seems so specific and seems so inherently tied to this idea that it has to do with you know being a sexual deviant. But if the warrant is saying there was no evidence of sexual trauma or assault, I'm I'm like I'm trying to understand what he why what is the motive? Like what are you doing? I know that's that's okay, so I didn't know that. So thank you for saying that because wow, my I'm I'm shifting gears here what a what a wrench that throws into it's entirely possible that it may just have been omitted from the warrant and from the report although i think that would be shocking if it was but this is the conclusion that a lot of people are are coming to from like the absence of that because they would talk about the bodies being staged so why not talk about the sexual trauma if there was any yeah i just i mean all of it is senseless of course like whether he was going after them for you know horrifying sexual reasons or not i'm just trying to understand what is the what is the motive for any of it is it just to kill is it the thrill of killing it just seems so especially weird to do it in, if it's just for the thrill of killing in daylight and to two people together like that is crazy to me I have a note on the daylight thing. Okay, so I'm not sure if you <laughs> saw this, but the video footage, because we only have the, those three seconds, has been scrutinized, analyzed by online sleuths, people who have stellar you know, editing skills, and they have done some kind of a sharpening technology that could zoom in and like really kind of section out the, the items that he was wearing. He had a GoPro on the entire time, this guy. So the daylight aspect, I think, is because he had plotted to do this, which to me, I'm like, okay, this is definitively premeditated. I mean, nobody comes into the woods, um, you know, with, with the intention to do anything unless it's, you know, if, they, if they're wearing a GoPro, like they're coming in to do something, film themselves doing something. So he had intentions to capture what he was doing and make the most of it and kind of relive it, I think. Go back and watch yeah. those videos. The GoPro thing shocked me, but I think the daylight thing plays into that because he would have needed light to actually see what he was doing, even if it meant the risk of doing this in broad daylight. What? I know, I know. I Maybe I should jump into, let's see, because like I said, there is a new break in the case at this point after they hit the dead end. I have to figure out where exactly it comes from. Let's see. So we went through all of those. Edder, like I said, he was probably the last dead end they were going to look at for now. And then on December 6th of 2021, okay, this is approximately 9.50 p.m., Sergeant Jeremy Pierce, 
um, public information officer with the Indiana State Police, he announced the discovery of a fictitious online persona named Anthony underscore Shots. And Sergeant Pierce said that this profile had been uncovered during the course of the investigation in this in these murders and is believed to have been a profile that was used in 2016 and 2017 and had interacted with one of these girls just before the murders. And I looked deeper into this and the profile is set up like, um, I think it was on Instagram, but because I think if it was Snapchat, they probably would have asked for a picture, but it's some like guy who's like a model and it's like, I don't know, selfie pictures of him. Like it's a full catfish profile. Uh, but he had right. been talking to these girls for a while and probably like either planning to beat them or at least following their story, using it as some sort of a device, I think, to, to try to understand where they are at certain times or at least one of them. Mm-hmm. So what do we know after that? The press release said that they were asking for anybody who had had a social media contact to this person, if they had interacted with this user between 2016 and 2017, please come forward. And, you know, they asked anyone, you know, if they had any information, just call the Abbey and Libby tip line. And about a day or two later, uh, ISP released an additional statement related to the profile and had confirmed that they were able to track who it belonged to, which was 27-year-old Keegan Anthony Klein, who was from Peru, Indiana, which is not very far from Delphi. So now we've got a new suspect. And at the time of the press release, I think Klein was being held in a Miami County jail for 30, hear it, hear it well, 30 alleged crimes, including child exploitation, possession of child pornography, solicitation, uh, sexual intercourse, and obstruction of justice. I mean, like a full bona fide pedophile. So Klein was the one who was responsible, who had set up the fake profiles the fake social media accounts and had used the photos of the unknown male model to catfish these girls. And he was talking to Libby. That's who it was. He was talking to Libby German. So I think that actually makes sense. Uh, unlike the possibility that they were communicating, like maybe if it was even like disappearing text, if it was like vanish mode um, uh, in, in DMS on Instagram, or I imagine Snapchat for a lot of this planning to yeah. meet, And then like she brings her friend for backup or something, you know, she's nervous and the guy's walking towards them and she's like, this dude is a catfish. That when I saw his face and then realized that it was through Instagram and everything, mm -hmm. and you're describing that would be the reasoning for the video, that gives me that gut feeling of okay. It feels I it could feels see right. This person. I yeah, feel like I, I, under, I understand the person. thinking. I understand the reactions of the girls. Um, and I understand bringing a friend if like you're. Uh, yes. Oh, so much of it makes sense. And some of it, shit, so much of it makes me so angry. <laughs> I, I, that's how I felt. I felt sad, of course, reading this, but I felt angry for a lot of reading this case. I felt very upset. Oh, and, so did I. And I, I have a statement I see from Kelsey. So this is Kelsey German, Libby's sister. She said of Klein being a potential suspect. I think in the past, uh, when there were names that were put out in the media, it was more so the media putting them out there. But I think this is the first time that we've ever seen police put any sort of name out about a potential suspect, which I thought was interesting. Because there had been press conferences prior, but that is really true. Like Police had never definitively said, we are looking at this person, we see this person as prime suspect number one, or has some sort of affiliation or connection to this. They were just looking at people and the media had kind of picked up on stories. So the sister goes on to say that she has long believed and has stated that social media did not have anything to do with the case as far as like someone DMing them or tracking their location, but said that since this information has come out, she has since reconsidered things and is saying Libby never told me anything about anyone contacting her online. But since the latest release has happened, you know, uh, it's just made me think, even if she had told me and we had said something, she would have likely have kept messaging this person because that's what teenagers do. They like to hide things. Yeah. So it's entirely possible that this was a secret online relationship that nobody knew anything about except for maybe Abby. And can't you just imagine on a day off from school, you and your best friend being like, oh my God, we should like try to meet up with that guy. Like if absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, 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 I can totally perfect, picture the, that the thinking perfectly. I understood it. I was like, this makes complete sense. 
Especially, I mean, if it's not unsuspecting because the guy who was the catfish, the profile who's talking to them, he looks like their age. It's that's so much less threatening, especially if you have your friend with you to like go meet them in like a public place. Um, I don't know. And it's just, it's a combination of that, but also like the education around like minor and child safety when it comes to talking to, you know, folks online, I think does not go far enough because of cases like this. If this is what happened, but we don't even know what the message exchanges were because maybe police do, um, but they haven't released anything. Do we know if she had posted the pictures of the trail? Because I know she posted some to her Snapchat. Do we know if she posted them to her Instagram as well? That's not even clear. It just says that she posted them. So it could have been Snapchat story or it could, oh. have, been, yeah, or it could have been Instagram story. But I think if we're th- this profile was through Instagram, it was most likely her Instagram story. Oh, God. And she probably tagged the location. She probably added the location. Well... The, apparently they were taking like photos of this bridge or whatever. And it's mm-hmm. like a famous spot to go take pictures and stuff. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Th- yeah. So like if you were a local, if you knew the area, you would know exactly where they were. E- exactly. Yeah. Especially com- knowing yeah. like what the side entrance trail would be off of this highway that you pulled your, yeah. I don't know, your unregistered car into. Yeah. You're like, I know exactly how to get to like the old railroad bridge. So Klein, his potential connection remains under investigation as nothing, like I said, has been released or proven just yet, but there is great reason to believe that he may have been connected to the case. And like I said, if I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about how his mind works, predators, I think, do not do things like this off the cuff. You know, they're Mm -hmm. strategic and they do things covertly because their entire system I think is, is predicated on like um, falsehoods and creating, you know, false profiles and plans and like trying to get inside the minds of people and manipulating younger people. So to me, his connection to this falls in line with how premeditated I think the entire exchange and event, you know, the murder was. So mm-hmm. maybe, like I said, he had convinced Liberty, you know, to come meet him, like we said, after school, you know, on a day off from school, she's nervous, she brings Abby and then he's walking towards them <laughs> and they don't expect him to look like that. But also maybe he didn't expect her to bring a friend. I thought that as well. <gasps> so I think he oh. thought he was going to meet her alone and she just happened to have a friend with her. So suddenly he goes into panic plan B, which is now there's a witness. And now I have to, I have to jump into action and I have to kill them both. So from my own personal digging into the connection here and comparing him and his size and his height. This is where I ran into a bit of a a roadblock with this because Keegan is a a heavy set person. He's a very heavy set man and he has a lot of facial fat and he has a lot of fat around his neck. Uh, And it's not that the guy who's seen in the video is not a heavy guy, but he looked a bit different to me. What did you think? Did you actually see like cross compare his mugshot to the video? I did. I thought he looked a lot like the composite sketches. Um, mm-hmm. it, it did. Uh, I had the same feeling that he looked much heavier set than the video, but you have to remember that was like five years ago. He could have gained uh, a lot agreed. more weight. That I, I re, So I stepped back and I rethought about it and I was like, well, if we're talking about body size, I have to really look at this from the perspective of like, like you said, there could be weight gain, there could be weight loss. Um, there's also a strange angle there, but also there's a strange angle from how low the camera is if they're considerably shorter than him in filming. And it creates a different yeah. perception because the shots I've seen are at least at eye level of him or above him. So it gives me a different uh, perspective. But the one thing that I would call out where I was like, I, I, I feel like I, I can look at faces and generally like look to like characteristics where I'm like, there's crossover there. The one thing that I caught is the chin because he does have a lot of facial fat. And I, I think as does the person seen in the video, but he has a strong chin. And even when his face is tucked, the suspect in the video, you can see the light catches on the, um, the right side of his chin which to me indicates that he has a strong chin like um, Keegan does. And to me, I was like, even though I can't really see your face, that's a feature that's carried over that seems unlikely to just happen in both people. Knowing that you're all, you're both like bigger guys. I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 when I saw his photo, I just thought, okay, that looks like 
the sketch. It looks like the person in the video. Like it, it started to all make sense to me. One other thing I will say about that video, because again, we only have those three seconds. And like I said, the sleuths really went in and they were able to figure out he's got a GoPro on for sure. Like they can, they see part of the logo. So he's definitely there to film it. But if you look closely at his jacket, he's also carrying things in his pockets. He has items with him, like more than just like a singular weapon. He has items with him, which I thought was really interesting. So I did some more digging after people had called this out to try to see is there something in the warrant that would uh, that would explain like what he might have had on him, why he had those things, why he has the bulky pockets? So what we have, we know we have this kind of like older, heavy set man. Uh, he convinces two teenagers to you know do what he says without running. So I was thinking through, okay, so how does he do that? He either has a weapon on them or he has the faux police badge. And I think it was the police badge that he was flashing. If he says something like, guys down the hill and just flashes the badge and they listen to him. And then at some point, this is this I found out in the warrant. It's believed that they were bound, like their hands were bound behind their backs. I'm thinking cuffs. He put them in cuffs like a cop. Wait, this. Okay. This is all starting to really take effect for me because Mm -hmm. the sheriff that does these press conferences is so um, just like, pissed in the latter press conferences Mm -hmm. and it would make so much more sense that he would have that intense feeling and like we're gonna get you he says something in one of them that's like really he's like if you're he was like you might even be in this room like that makes it sound i could see him being that yes i could now it makes sense for me like why he could be so pissed off is because they know that the guy was in like He's a cop impersonator. impersonator. Yeah. Cop. I mean, flashing a faux badge to manipulate young girls and then puts them in cuffs, like as if they're in trouble. He like, I don't know. He could have said something like you're you were smoking weed or like maybe it even had to do with like the catfishing thing or like you're talking to like, I don't know what he could have said to them, but somehow it's believed he puts them in cuffs. And also imagine, okay, so if the bodies are staged, let's say they have cuffs on. If you're law enforcement, do you really want to release that? information and have people start questioning like other you know cops in the area claiming that they're you know it's just yeah. not a good well, look they, they may not have even have known i mean unless there there's a way to distinguish between like what are legit cuffs and you know what are cuffs that you can buy online but you can buy anything online you could probably get a very convincing and legitimate like police badge online i could probably find that right now yeah yeah. So I think that's what happened as far as like the hands being bound. And I'll tell you why, because I did some more research on the actual families and the interviews because they're giving more information than I think, A, they were told to um, just because people ask and, and they just talk about the case and what they know. So I'm listening to the families and I looked at the public interviews that they have and it's believed that both of their hands were bound potentially with cuffs and they were ordered down the hill at this point. So then I believe that is where Libby lost her balance while walking you know, down the steepness of the hill and she couldn't stabilize herself because her hands are tied behind her back. So she falls and in the process, she loses her shoe. This was described in the warrant that a shoe was missing. It's later recovered on the hill that they walked down. So we know that this is, we kind of know like this area, like they were traveling trail wise because they were then made to cross Deer Creek So why? It's believed that he did this intentionally. Like he had this plan all along so he could distance them. He could walk them out from where the historic like railroad trail is and like where like foot traffic would normally be if God forbid somebody else came along in the light of day. So he makes them walk like a half a mile across the stream where he knows nobody's going to cross the creek. Nobody's going to cross that. But it's also, it turns out to be that that is actually closer to where the car was parked. So this is mm. all this is all part of his master plan where he's like, I'm going to get them away from the main trail, far out, where people, A, can't hear them screaming if they do, or they're definitely not going to see them, but also I'm going to be close enough to my getaway car, or at least a car where I can change clothes, mm-hmm. that this is going to work out for me. So the thought is that while they're cuffed, she falls down the hill, loses the shoe, and that's when she starts to try to, like, kick and, like, fight back at him. He quickly overpowers her or threatens her. 
they're continuing to walk. He makes them cross the creek. They're in that location, and that's where he actually kills them. And then once he cuts them, I think it's, it's believed he cut their neck because there, it was described in the warrant there was a significant amount of blood that they lost. And then yeah. he goes back to his car, this unregistered car, and he changes his clothes. And then, I don't know, just walks off. Unsuspecting person. <sighs> Oh, I get chills throughout this entire thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I did, I did a def, uh, even more research actually on these warrants. So like I said, the blood was mentioned, the blunt object um, assumed to be the knife or whatever was used for the slash wounds, but it was also described. There were two items that were missing clothing items. And it's been deduced from people who have like done a lot of research on this, that it was most likely the underwear of both girls, which is even more interesting because if we're, if, we're seeing it detailed the absence of sexual assault, but he's taking their underwear. I, I, it's like, I can't wrap doesn't my head it, around this. <laughs> like, doesn't it all track though? If you are, um, selling like child pornography or you're like, you are in that dark web space to yeah. be, if you can't film it happening because now the friends here, you might as well get, you know, the garments and be able to sell those online or, you know, do whatever with those. Like, yeah, he, he, oh, God. I mean, <sighs> I, I still think the whole thing was filmed because of that GoPro. But, well, what's assumed now is that if the underwear was missing on both girls, they were most, like, they were most likely both found nude in those woods with uh, slash marks on their neck. And then, yeah, this guy just gets away with the two... two um, pieces of underwear and he gets back to his car, changes his clothes and never seems to get caught. But then this is where up until this point, we've been talking about Keegan, right? This is where the warrant threw me for a loop. So I should also credit where this warrant is from and how it was obtained. So this came from the murder sheet podcast and it was obtained through Fox 59 in Indianapolis. So the FBI in this warrant, this is dating back to March, um, 2017, uh, the agency, had probable cause at the time to look at Ron Logan, who was the man who owned the property where the two girls were found murdered. It was like his house is like 1,400 feet away from the actual site. So the Warren said that there is evidence in this case that could be found in his home. Agents uh, wanted to search the outbuildings of the property and Logan's vehicle for anything that may have to do with the case, including forensic evidence, hair, bodily fluids, Guns, which also could mean that they they were shot as well before or after they were cut. Um, cutting instruments as well as electronic devices and storage media indicating that they most likely knew that this was an event that was filmed. Or he had been at least communicating with these girls. So some of the details provided in the warrant have yet to be made. They haven't been made fully public. This was like selective release. Um, but like we said, we, we knew from this that Libby used her own cell phone to capture the image uh, and the video as well as the voice of the, sus of the suspect saying down the hill. That was captured at 2.13 p.m. Now remember, they posted the picture of where they were at 2.07. So the window seems too tight for anybody to see that picture and be like, I've got a race there and like meet them, actually like confront them by 2.13 p.m. in the woods. But according to the search warrant um, and... <laughs> Uh, the recording of German's phone uh, or on German's phone lasted 43 seconds and only the small portion of that audio, you know, has been made public. The voice didn't match to this guy, Ron, but mm -hmm. that could be for any number of reasons. Um, it, it could have been, uh, he could have changed his voice during like a deposition when he was recorded. I don't know what could have happened, but that was something that they, they indicated that his voice did not seem to match what they had on the recording. Um, and like I said, it says that the suspect took two souvenirs is what they described it as the two clothing items that were found missing from the girls, most likely the underwear, their bodies were staged. Um, and the warrant also indicated the rest of their clothing was found, which to me seems very clear that they were, like I said, found nude. Yeah. And what else he had found? physically removed something or took photos from the crime scene. Somehow they were able to find that as well, that he, like, they were able to figure out that he had filmed this or, like, took Polaroids or something. Because they're talking about it like it's physical evidence, like a physical picture, which I think is interesting. Yeah. 
and they recovered unknown fibers and unidentified hairs, which was it was described they might belong to an animal, which people have run to the hills with that. They were like, well, this could be somebody who has a pet at home. It could be somebody who comes from a farm. It could have been somebody who was performing a ritual. A lot of people have really gone with the ritual route of this because he had huh. so many things in his jacket. People have said he was carrying more than just like weapons. Like he was carrying like items to perform something. And this ties into like the strange staging and positioning of the bodies. A lot of people have said, I don't really know if I buy that, but a lot of people are siding with it. That's very interesting. I, I need to look at the pockets in that still. Cause I didn't, I didn't notice that, but I, I did notice his hands are in his pockets. So like oh, whatever yeah. he was, he was probably holding those items in his pockets. He's getting ready to pull something out for sure in that video. Yeah. But I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure it was that badge because I think walking up to them, he knew that that was how that was going to go down. Yeah. But this is the other part of this warrant where things are detailed. So they're, they're looking at this guy, Ron, I said, like as, the, as another suspect. Um, and this is where things get a little funny. So even though they're like, the voice doesn't seem to match, this is where they freak out because it's revealed that he lied about his alibi, that a friend had picked him up um, from his home on February 13th when they talked to him. He said, I was picked up between like 2 to 2.30, which very specific time um, that he gave prior to him actually being accused or told of the actual time frame that the girls were interacted with that guy, which was 2.13. So he mm -hmm. says, I was picked up between 2 to 2.30, he mentions to them, uh, for a trip to the aquarium store. And on February 14th, he reportedly told a family member to relay that story to police and say that he had gotten home between 5 to 5.30 p.m. that day on February 13th. So then once his home is searched, documents show a receipt that was found on Logan, in Logan's home from the store that he mentioned. And it was dated for Fe February 13th, but the checkout time was 5.21 p.m. And the store was more than a half hour away from his home. So the funny part about that is that like, okay, well, he, the timing of that is off. So he's incorrect, but maybe he could have just gotten mixed up. Is that really consequential to this case? The funny part about it is that he gave this alibi prior to the announcement that the girls had been murdered. <laughs> That's mm. strange to me. But up, up into this point, well, up into this point, I had only thought of Keegan as being anyone who could, you know, most closely be involved. I just find like the alibi thing to be a, an odd kink in the story. Yeah. The alibi thing and uh, to tell your family member that to say something for you is very very suspicious obviously yeah prior to actually being questioned by police and, pr and prior to like the official announcement that these girls were killed and knowing mm -hmm. that they were killed at probably around I'm gonna say 213 to maybe 230 was when all of this happened and saying yeah. that's exactly when I left but then it gets worse because they actually retrieve his phone and they look at his phone records so Ron Logan's cell phone was in the area um, of that bridge of the actual trail on the afternoon of February 13th. And he sent a text message later that night at 7.56, the same day it showed that his phone was not only likely outside of his home, but within extreme close proximity to the actual murder scene. And remember, they hadn't found the bodies until 20, a full 24 hours after February 13th. So let's think about that. He's, he gives an alibi early <laughs> during like the search <laughs> efforts. And he also sends a, he gets a ping from his phone because he sends a text message at 7.56 p.m. the day of the murders with an extreme close proximity to the actual murder scene outside of his home. Funny. I, I did read that he claimed to have told the family member to like lie about his location because he apparently had been arrested for like drinking and driving or something or. Oh, so he's just like, possibly, I don't want, I don't want any run yeah. with the law kind of thing. Yes. Yes. So that was like the only reason I sort of was like, okay, maybe he was just, but I didn't realize that it was before they announced. That's what I've, I looked that up twice in the research. Cause I was like, is this correct? But yeah, it was prior to actually announcing that there had been a murder um, that he had asked family to like, this is my alibi kind of thing. 
That's but so strange. They do end up searching his house and they ultimately find nothing. And he has since died. I think he died of January of this year or maybe last year. Mm-hmm. And I think if there was anything they would have found that was like solid proof of connection, it would have been found by now. His just happened to be an odd kink in the story. And I still side with the idea that it was probably Keegan who was involved. That's yeah. That's who I still feel like is the only one that I don't rule out. That is, I mean, it is such a big leap in my mind to think about like, of course, like he did horrific things up until that point. He has, you know, 30 pending felony charges, but I don't know. I mean, murder just seemed like such a, unless he had been planning that for such a long time, but it just seems so it all, all tracks. I mean, like the online persona, knowing the area very well, the GoPro. Come on. I think you hit the nail on the head with him not suspecting a friend to be there. That That's how I imagined it. I, cause like, yeah. I don't think she would have necessarily said that. Cause like, if you say like, I'm going to go, I'm going to like, yeah, I'll meet you. I'm referencing back to when I was like 15 and like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you like yeah you like you bring a friend with you and you're like just stay with me for like just for like a little bit and then maybe we might like walk off or something for a little bit and this dude just comes around a corner oh that must have been so chilling so so chilling to see him come close and oh my god the most devastating part is that in theory they probably could have gotten away if he hadn't manipulated them and maybe flashed a badge or something. Mm -hmm. This is us sowing the seeds of saying why you can't trust County. This is what happens. You cannot trust County. I mean, you certainly can't trust County to solve a case as it appears. No. (laughs) Although this is, this is in the hands of state and FBI at this point. I was going to say at least. (laughs) Yeah. Well, but at least they have the, like, I, I remember there's a, a press conference where the superintendent says, um, I have just as much of a fire lit under me yeah. to solve this as I did. He was like, I have more of a fire to solve it now. And it's like three years later, he was like, than I did when we first, it's even greater is what he was trying to say. Than but it here, was okay. The so sort of caveat the conversation though, we're talking about like, cause I think we're both in agreement that we're like, yeah, Keegan is the most likely person. He yeah. is most likely to have been the person to have done this. He's in custody. They should have, in theory, they should have everything they need. Why is it taking so long? Because they still have not named him with any connection to them outside of that account between 2016 2017 of talking to Libby. Could you imagine if they eventually rule him out? What the fuck do we have to go on then? It's like... <sighs> I, I don't even know how to approach it at that point because I put so much stock in the idea that he is behind this. How do they not have, like, DNA testing that they can do? They said they recovered DNA. They said they recovered DNA. So I'm, I'm like, if they recovered DNA and they have him in custody and they can clearly get DNA samples, fingerprint samples, what are we waiting on? To me, that's freaking me out even more, like the waiting, because it's telling me that they don't have concrete proof that he did this and he was there, despite all of the suggestive evidence. <sighs> And I feel like I, sometimes I feel like like full like law and order. Um, I don't know. Like so, do I. so do like, I. So do I. Like I'm sitting in like an interrogation room under a fluorescent and I've got like a cigarette burning I know. and I'm like, it doesn't add up. Like I know. It's, it's funny because I feel that so many other podcasts, it's about just kind of recounting the story and not really theorizing. But I feel like we're always on the brink of cracking the case because we're two <laughs> extraordinarily determined people, and we're like, we have to solve it right now, and there's no chance. I, of yeah, doing I that. especially know it like as me as I reiterate like 17 times. I'm like, by the way, we have absolutely no information because police have not released everything. I just, uh, I mean, I've also the, the other problem too because I was doing more research on this again this morning that the audio recording that we have of the guy, the suspect that's found on German's phone. There's now audio recording that's been released of Keegan's voice from in prison. It's different. But, Uh. but, but that could be for a number of things, especially if you're impersonating a cop or a persona like a cop, an authoritative figure, 
that is a different experience where you're like guys down the hill versus like being in prison like you're caught on hot mic or something talking on the phone to like your family. Yeah. You know, like people throw their <sighs> voice. You heard me last podcast doing Nancy Grace. You couldn't tell it was me. <laughs> I, I could, I could uh, have been on HLN and you wouldn't Do you want to know? <laughs> Okay, I feel like we can give ourselves a little bit of reprieve right we now. We can, we can. That was a lot. Uh, okay. It was very heavy to get into, and I'm happy that we yes we got to tell it with like a you know a good composure. Yes, yes. Um, I feel like we did a good job because it is so sensitive and like as it's ongoing and just so sad when there's two young girls like oh. You have um, to give yourself a little release after, otherwise you just sit yeah. in it and it's just really horrific. I so this was my release. Is that the other day after our Nancy Grace episode? Extravaganza. (laughs) Extravaganza. (laughs) I started YouTubing clips of Nancy Grace. I went down a YouTube (laughs) rabbit hole of the best of Nancy Grace. And I, she is so, she's lethal. Like, (laughs) I was watching an interview, an interview where she, I, and I need to like see what this was actually about, but I guess she was accusing this man of having his like son had been kidnapped or something, and I, she was trying to like question the father on television, she's and she's a like, "Prosecutor, yeah, yeah," and she's like, "We are getting reports live right now that your son has been found in your basement." What? <laughs> and I was like, "What?" And the man is like. What? What? And starts shaking on television. She's like, You heard me. We have found and we are hearing news. She could have only have existed in like the mid 2000s to get away with shit. I know. I know. And the guy starts like shaking and he like can't breathe. Like, I was just thinking to myself, Oh my God. That. And then there was this like insane interview where she's going after two chains. (laughs) I've seen that. Like, they're going toe to toe. What was it about? Was it about weed? Yes, yes. Oh, God. Two chains. <laughs> Two chains. It's she suggesting. Is, she's, vicious. she's vicious. She's vicious. Oh, and then I watched the um, Hollywood Medium episode. Did you? <laughs> God. I did. You've ingested quite a bit of it. Can you send me links to these? I need to. I need to. I thought of you when I was... It's not the whole episode. It was like a 12-minute clip, which okay. that actually might be the whole episode because I think he does multiple celebrities, but um, he... I guess it starts, he like gets in touch with her fiance, like ex fiance that was like murdered. Oh God. This or something. Been through it's, it. I understand her greater than I know. <laughs> like, I know. Oh my goodness. But Nancy, no, she, she, she is very much like that though. I'm, it's coming back to me now just how like vindictive and abrasive she can be like when especially when talking to like the families of the people who are suffering through this where it, it could it's like a father who's like lost four children in a fire she's like what do you know that you're not saying we're gonna I know. find she out really, i'm like chill out <laughs> she really she is definitely guilty until proven innocent like <laughs> she is <laughs> oh lord i could not imagine having her as like a mom <laughs> yeah. Well, Dude. listen, we'll get to we'll get to see her and interact with her at CrimeCon next year. We'll see you there, creepers. Yes. <laughs> yes, we'll see you there, creepers. We're putting that on our vision board. <laughs> if you think <laughs> that's going, yeah, going on my manifestation um cork board. If you think yes. I won't walk right up to that woman and go, Casey Anthony is a mother, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. Cause I will go straight up to that face, <gasps> eye to eye. <laughs> I will actually uh, keel over. I will keel over and then I'll be like, Nancy, do you remember my mom? You guys met at her salon, her nail salon. <laughs> maybe maybe that part should come before I go to her face and I yeah. go, Casey Anthony. She will take a stun gun oh. and put it right to my heart. She will kill me <laughs> right at crack on. <laughs> or or she'll ask you to be on her show because I got more tea for my mom. <laughs> I was asking my mom about Nancy Grace and her interaction with her. I was like, I know you told me about this years ago, but we've been giggling on the podcast so much about Nancy Grace. Like, what else do I not know about that interaction? And apparently Nancy was like, oh, my God, you're a hoot. You should go on my show. 
Oh no! I would love. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine? That was like no. You that know what? Been you amazing. got spunk, kid. You're gonna come on the Nancy <laughs> Hour. <laughs> spunk. Yeah, I can just hear her saying. We need to come up with like a Nancy Grace uh, glossary of terms <laughs> that she yes. uses. So if we got tomfoolery, you've mentioned last podcast. We said smoke and mirrors. Yes. Um, smoke and mirrors. Bruise tube. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, there's so there are so many others <laughs> like shenanigans. Um, it's it's just everything that like beckons like distrust. It's like, yes, he is a liar of grand proportions. Like the way she yes, plays, like, yes. It's unmatched. It's unmatched, but uncouth. <laughs> It's a lot of forensic like stuff too, where she's like, they dug up the grape. We're looking at DNA. <laughs> Wait, that was amazing. The way you just the cadence <laughs> of the A. A. Well, I was I was losing my mind over the way you said tube last time, because it's like, it's almost like not full voice. It's like tube. Tube. <laughs> it's guttural. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I've given myself the laugh I needed. Thank you for that. Um, and yes. thank you to everybody, all the creepers who listened through to the story of the Delphi case, because it is it is one that I, as all unsolved cases, it deserves to be talked about, and it deserves to continue to see amplification and, and voice and impact around it, because it's not solved, and it seems so close. And for all we know, the police may know more than we don't have, and they've got their suspect. They've got him. It's Keegan, without a doubt. It just infuriates me that we're now in 2022, a half a decade out, the guy's in custody, and we still don't have it nailed down. Yeah. What the hell's going on, Indiana? I know. Well, what I'll say to you um, is that the parents have said over and over again that the greatest way that like we can honor uh, Libby, that these are Libby's parents, mm-hmm. um, is to any sort of feeling you have or tip you have potential tip yeah. to share it with the police. Please don't rationalize it away. If you have a neighbor that's been acting funky or like anything kind of out of sorts that they would like you to share and continue to let, let the police decide it, whether it's rational or not. Oh but yeah. I mean, I wonder how many other is, people this account interacted with that probably haven't even come forward. I know. Anthony underscore shots. I mean, he's, I, could imagine i think when i saw the screenshot of his account he had like 78 followers and i think was maybe following like 200 some odd accounts and i could imagine that there were a lot of girls there that this guy was talking to and maybe plotting yeah. something libby maybe just happened to be i don't know if susceptible is the right word um because of course you're susceptible when you're 13 14 but maybe she was the only one who agreed to like meet in person you but know, she, it will be incredible. Be off. Yeah. What will be incredible is that because it was so long ago, I don't know, like, if he deleted the Instagram or, like, if he deleted the messages, if they're able to recover them, that would be, I think, the crack in the case. They must have recovered something because they found some evidence that tied him to her to say, like, they were messaging. Yeah. So they must have found something in the archives of the messages that they were able to say, like, yes definitively we know they were talking they just haven't released it they haven't released yeah. anything we it's incredible how much people have pulled from this case because we have had nothing to go off of like n- almost nothing i know a three second video a one second audio clip come on but it's ju- it's just like Gosh. missy beavers in so many ways the filming of i the know actual act, it reminded me yes broad daylight I suppose. Well, I guess that was early morning, but still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will keep an eye on this one. We will continue to look for the Delphi uh, case and see if there are any answers that will come. And maybe we'll do a part two to this episode if we ever do come come upon some break in the case or maybe a conviction for Keegan someday if he was responsible. Because like I said, if he gets ruled out, I'm going to lose my shit. Because, like, I know. <laughs> I've really, like, built up the case in my mind now that he is 100% the guy. But we shall see. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for coming along for the ride. We will catch you guys on another Creep Time. Catch you next week. Bye. Bye.